Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the seminar. I'm sure some more people will join us along the way, as they already are. Um, and uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Amin and um, Palata and Ryashna. Ryashni, isn't it? Ryashna. Ryashna. Yeah, I'll get it right. Um, uh, would you guys unmute? I mean, would you just show your faces for a minute so that I can introduce you to everybody? Where's my, where are my mates? There's one of them. <laughs> uh, polite is too polite, I think. <laughs> uh, polite, can you, can you let us see you? I, think. I know you exist because oh, yeah. we had those meetings. <laughs> Just uh, just until Amin starts, so that we can see you, and um, then I'll just introduce you. Uh, we've got an hour for this talk, uh, Amin. So I don't know how long you'd like to um, to talk and how much time you'd like to leave for discussion. I thought about forty minutes. How much did you plan for? Uh, Marissa, I have to confess that uh, when I put, I, I changed the talk a bit, and I I didn't have time to um, to practice my timing again after I changed. So, um, but a forty, you mean forty minutes to talk is quite a bit. It's double what I had in. No, so that's I, not good. I'll give you a warning at about thirty-five minutes. Uh, okay. Right, so the three people whom I'd like to introduce, you can see them now, uh, are from UCT and they're from CHED. CHED is a faculty which is devoted to um, academic support throughout the university. So they work across all the other faculties at the university. Am I right, Amin? Yes. And um, Amin is the director of CHED. And the is deputy director, am I right? Uh, of ADP in Shed. Oh, of ADC in Shed. Okay. You've just given us a raise. <laughs> oh, they've given you a raise. Well, this is to celebrate. No, you have given us a raise to make us directors of Shed instead of ADC. Oh, oh, okay. Well, that's what we think of you. You know, we're very... Uh... Wow. <laughs> now, I need to explain to everybody who's here today that what we're doing is we are showcasing some of the talks um, from the proceedings of the 2019, gosh, it's 2021, of the 2019 uh, colloquium, which we had at UP. And uh, what we agreed to do at that um, meeting was that we would produce a referee proceedings. So we asked people to put their names forward uh, for the refereed proceedings. And we started a long process. Uh, initially, we'd hoped to actually have a face-to-face -face workshop. But as you all know, that didn't happen in April 2020. So uh, Fred Lubin very kindly partnered with us. He was going to run the workshop. And uh, to talk just about this current group, we went through two rounds of reviews. Uh, they were sent out to reviewers. They got comments back. We discussed uh, over Zoom meeting um, uh, to, to talk about the changes they wanted to make to the paper. And then they sent it back. And then we had a second round. But I don't think we had, did we have another meeting for that? I can't remember. I think we might have had a second one, yeah. And then finally, they sent us their final thing. and. Um, the proceedings now exist as a refereed entity. And so there are eight papers in the proceedings. And Amin, Ryashna, and Palat's uh, article is number one in the, uh, and it's an interesting article because it's about, in a way, about policy and structure of curriculum. So I think it concerns people right across the, uh, extended curriculum program. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Amin. I see you've got your slides up and ready to go. Um, thanks to Joni for doing all these arrangements. And please go ahead. 
Um, thank you very much, Marissa, um, for the invitation and journey for helping us to set it up. Um, thank you also to everyone um, who's come to this presentation, um, including my colleagues. Um, I, it's very nice to have you here. Um, it's a sign of how hard we are working at the moment that we didn't actually have time to talk about um, how we were going to do this presentation. So Riyashan and Polite, um, with your permission, I'm, I'm just going to, to do the presentation. And without your permission, I have actually added in all sorts of things that you took out at various points. <laughs> I mean, that's just a joke. But I have added in a number of um, mainly sort of historical moments, quotations and so on, um, because I thought it would be quite useful for us to um, think about how our particular moment now relates to the extended curriculum programs. When we did this presentation in 2019, obviously we were in a very different space and a very different time. Um, COVID has come along and has made our worlds upside down. So I thought I would um, expand a bit on um, the original paper. Um, and so the first bit that I want to dwell on are a couple of policy moments surrounding uh, what we would call um, academic support programs, academic development programs, foundation programs, or then um, extended curriculum programs, all those different names that things have been called um, in South Africa over the years. Um, so starting with the education white paper, I just want to give a kind of reflection of how what we are involved with when we talk about ECPs, how it was reflected upon in the policy over the years. So in the education white paper of 1997, um, our programs were thought of as integral elements of a higher education system. That was a sort of aspirational um, expression. They were not yet integral, but we wanted them to be integral. Um, some of the goals were that they should work towards more equitable student access, improved quality of teaching and research, increased student progression and graduation rates, and greater responsiveness to social and economic needs. Um, and then lastly, the financial side that they should be incorporated into the funding formula. So this was in the days before we received uh, funding for our programs. So you can see that the aspirations, the ideals, the goals were high. And maybe we can think about whether we have achieved now many years later, a good 23 years later, 24 years almost later, whether we have achieved on what the education white paper set as a set of goals and aspirations. And then the next step, four years later, the National Plan for Higher Education really presented foundation programs as a transitional measure. I thought that was quite interesting when looking at the policy that they never thought of what we were doing as long lasting. And I even wondered whether in 2001, when someone, when the team were wrote, writing the National Plan for Higher Education, whether they thought that ECPs would still be around in 2021. Um, at that stage, um, the, um, the writers lamented the add-on nature of foundation programs and recommended integration into the structure of the overall curriculum. Now we can ask ourselves the question, how far are we on that road? How integrated are we into the overall curriculum? Um, the national plan also announced a shift from a predominant focus on access, that is allowing students into universities, to long-term student success and graduation. So there was a, a priority shift to um, equity of outcomes, from equity of access to equity of outcomes. Um, 
And then, of course, the, the next development was in 2003 when it was announced that um, there was going to be earmarked government funding for these programs, and that actually started happening in 2004. And in 2012, policy guidelines um, appeared that have been formulate, uh, uh, formulated for us. And I would say that those policy guidelines really institutionalized ECPs and safeguarded them um, through sustained funding. So, I mean, this is sort of a hop, skip um, and jump through the policy, um, but it's a long road from those announcements in 1997 to the policy guidelines in 2012. My question today, even more so than in 2019, is, like, where are we now? In the meantime, very soon after the formulation of the policy, there was actually a moment in 2013 where the transitional nature of ECPs really seemed to be taken seriously. And that is when the case for a flexible curriculum structure was put forward. There was a, a moment at that point so 12 years after the national plan, uh, where a number of educationists said, let's do away with the separateness of the foundation programs and let's move into a flexible curriculum uh, structure for all students. That would be completely removing the add-on nature and it would mean that we would be completely integrated in the curriculum. That was turned down. And since then, we've really been in a kind of doldrums. We haven't really known where we're going around, uh, going with policy. In September 2019, as you know, there was a meeting um, of stakeholders and some new policy, which was really not a significant change uh, from the previous um, policy that we had, it, it wasn't hugely different. That emerged, but since then, there's been really nothing. So that's the policy side. I thought that what we could also look at is some commentary from people who've spoken about academic development, academic support work, academic development work, foundation programs, and so forth. So my first person is actually Kanyili. I think I got that wrong. I thought I made a mistake and then put in an extra syllable. In 1986, Kanyili said, um, and this was at the ASP conference in Peter Maritzburg. Trans uh, he spoke about the transformative potential of um, foundation programs, but said the path towards transformation will not be an easy one. It will require becoming part of a pioneering process that challenges many of the traditional concepts and structures of tertiary education. And these are jealously guarded by powerful forces and vested interests inside and outside the university. Here is someone talking from the apartheid period. At the same conference, Ian Scott said, ASPs may not only be failing to promote essential change, but in fact serving to inhibit it. So very critical of academic support programs. If the real work of the ASP is relegated to a permanently peripheral role, if academic support is limited to being a survival kit for a minority of disadvantaged students, then it will be trapped in a reformist operation that could serve to enable the university to respond in a limited but visible way to the inequities of our society without bringing about the kind of change that will make the institution truly open. I thought that was, you know, like said in 1986, let's not have a survival kit for a few students. Let's not have universities trapped in kind of like highly visible, but actually small ways of dealing with the huge inequities of our society. So right from the beginning, seeing these programs as um, constructs that could be marginal and marginalizing and not really leading to transformation. So that was spoken from right in the one of the most difficult uh, times of apartheid. At the same conference, Vilakazi um, said, 
the need for a revolution in education that counters deficit notions, stigmatizing students for academic difficulties instead of blaming the educational system, which is designed and controlled by the ruling upper classes and within which the oppressed communities shall always feel alienated. Instead of this, we need a total transformation linguistically, culturally, psychologically in concept formation and deliverance of education. So in 2015, we thought decolonizing the university was new. Here is someone speaking in 1986 about how tertiary education is under the ruling of the upper classes and how some people will always feel alienated unless there's a total transformation of language, culture, psychology, concept formation, delivery. Okay, and then I'm skipping right into 2015-2016 where Leibovitz and uh, Bozelek still lament that um, ECPs address narrow bands of mostly black students while it is the majority of the intake that would benefit from systemic change. That it focuses on the first year instead of all transitional moments, that it leads to othering, stigmatization of students and staff isolation of innovative educational conversations and pedagogies in a set of programs, whereas institutions go scot-free and continue to do the things as they used to. Um, a, a strong accusation from Koza uh, Shangasi in 2019 that ECPs hide racial discrimination under the guise of offering support and then Luckett and Shea in 2020 saying that ECPs reinforce colonial colonial power and knowledge structures. Okay, so these are voices reverberating um, through several decades. And just to give you a pointer of what was happening at the time, uh, Kanyeli couldn't do his address because he was hiding from the security police at that point, and the security police were at the ASP conference. So here, they, um, our colleagues from 1986 um, were actually on the wrong side of government. From the 1990s to, to 2014, we in ADP sort of moved to the right side of government. We, we got policy that um, actually safeguarded our programs and translated, um, the, the policy was translated into programs across the country's campuses. So we thought we were on the right side. Um, but actually we ended up on the wrong side of the kind of activism that was happening in the 19, in 1986 when um, roads must fall, feast must fall, um, started criticizing us um, as part of colonization, as part of legacies of colonialism and apartheid, and um, these student groupings asking for immediate changes to landscapes, demographics, financial models, and curricula. So here we found ourselves on the wrong side, and I don't know about you at your institutions, but at UCT, we certainly found that the ECPs were, start, were, were targeted as um, stigmatizing constructs. However, despite all this, in 2018, 12% of first-time entering students were on ECPs. We had, we had 343 ECPs in the country, and we had 22 of the 26 institutions offering them. Um, what remained the same is retention and graduation rates were still unacceptably low, better than you know, I'm not saying nothing has changed. The landscape has changed since 1986, but we're still struggling with retention and graduation rates that are unacceptably low. 30% um, of the 2013 cohort on three-year degrees at contact universities graduated in regulation time, and 59% had graduated in six years, and there's still significant racial inequalities in these rates. So, in 2020, we have to ask the question about the role of ECPs at our institutions. And I mentioned 2020 here because that, of course, is um, the year in which we started experiencing COVID-19. So what has that done for um, 
our programs. Um, just giving a, a, a glimpse from UCT, I think it has put us again in a different position in that suddenly people are asking solutions from ADP, whereas in the past we were sort of marginalized and not many people really wanted to know what we were doing. Suddenly in 2020, we actually have people saying, do you maybe have ideas of what we can do in this emergency? And I want to broaden out that question to say, what should the future of ECPs look like? Is there a future? Um, what should it look like? And what should the policy underpinning ECPs look like? Um, there hasn't really been a response. There's been a resounding silence now since for a long time about where we are going with ECP policy. So what we've done in our paper is to look at the intended outcomes of the policy that we are working with at the moment. So that's the 2012 policy guidelines and some of the discussions that led up to them. So we looked at the policy and found that there were these big principles. The first one is of social justice and redress. It is a program um, steering social justice and redress in an in equity South Africa, emerging from apartheid, but continuing with these inequities, even now into the 2020s. Um, equity, uh, the social justice and redress program can be brought, uh, broken into equity of access, which means bringing people into the institution, equity of outcomes, making sure that, um, you, that people entering the university have a, an equal chance of graduating, completing their study successfully. Another key principle or outcome, intended outcome of policy is bridging the articulation gap, mainly from school into the first year and to counter the high dropout in first year. And then of course, systemic transformation of institutions, not the kind of add on that um, we were speaking about. I'm not going to go into this um, slide much, just to say that the current policy guidelines, they're not really ideological. They are rules. They are a set of rules and steering mechanisms. So we have these four types of ECP courses that I'm not going to go into. You, you know the extended, the augmented, the fully foundational and the augmenting course. Um, some of them have exact equivalents in the curriculum, others don't. The extended and augmented courses have equivalents. So you have a maths course or an extended maths course, and they're supposed to do the same thing. Whereas a fully foundational maths course is a sort of pre-course that you do before you do the sort of maths course of the university. Um, and so, I mean, I just thought that that was a sort of useful summary to make. So the one steering mechanism are these building blocks that you build a curriculum with. And the other steering mechanism, of course, is that you get earmarked funding linked to the students sitting on these courses. Um, the institutional context within which we looked at our extended curriculum programs and their performance just to say that UCT sees itself as a research intensive um, institution. It is historically white and historically English speaking. Um, it actually decided to stay smallish, medium sized. And for that reason, admissions are highly competitive. Um, the entrance scores are very high. Um, so 81% of the first time entering South African students who had written the NSC achieved an A or B aggregate symbol in 2019. And I realized that we are very, very fortunate at UCT to have such very good students. 91%, uh, however, despite that, we still have um, a gap, an achievement gap, um, which is racial. So 91% of our white students versus 78% of our black African students achieved an A or B aggregate symbol. Still very high, but there is this gap. And in the undergraduate course success rate, 93% for, um, that was 93% for white students versus 75% for black students. 
Um, and a, a, a terrible statistic is that 21% of white graduates is achieved the first class pass versus 2% of black, uh, black African graduates and 25% of white uh, graduates an upper second class versus 10% of black African graduates in 2017. And this is what determines whether people can carry on into postgraduate studies or can do high stakes, can compete for high stakes uh, professions. So despite having this excellent um, pool of students that we draw from, UCT still has problems with throughput um, and it has a racial achievement gap. So as far as the ECPs are concerned at UCT, about 15% of new first years go into them. Um, and I mean, like, there is definitely an association with um, socioeconomic disadvantage. 75% of students registered on ECPs um, had these indicators of social disadvantage that we used, as opposed to 48% of students in the regular curricula. So it does cater for students who are socioeconomically challenged. Um, so from that point of view, we would say that the ECPs do have a sort of equity of access function. Um, we had nine ECPs in 2019 in all the faculties. And as Marissa said, they're offered by specialized ADP units. Placement in EDPs happen in two ways. Um, in humanities and in commerce, students are placed in ECPs from the outset at the beginning of the year. Uh, in commerce, basically they apply, they they're not placed, they apply to go into an ECP. And then there's a transfer mechanism where in, in the other faculties where students actually all enter at the beginning of the year on the required um, faculty point scores. But after a certain point, either in April or June, um, if they don't do well in the regular courses, they get transferred onto ECPs. So now we'll just look at um, some of the ECPs. I might not have time for all of them, um, but the first one is humanities, which is really the only access model that we still have, where students are directly placed um, and they do not meet faculty admissions criteria. So they have lower than the faculty's required criteria and they get given an opportunity to come into the faculty to have access to the university, um, even though their scores are lower than the, university, uh, the faculty scores, required scores. It's only for black students. And here I use the term inclusively. Um, the, the program is really fully foundational and augmenting courses combined with regular courses. And we encountered real problems with stigma, especially during the roads must fall, fees must fall period. And I mean, looking into it, we find that both the fully foundational and the augmenting courses do not have corresponding equivalents in the regular curriculum. So students looked around, said, we are all black students in class, and we're all doing extra courses and they seem to be skills based courses that no one else has to do. And yet, when we look at our fellow students, they also fail, but they don't have to come onto these special courses and they don't have to do an extra year from the outset. So there was a lot of stigma around that. And the response was that the humanities faculty went into a, the, the humanities EDU, the ADP unit, they went into a curriculum innovation period where instead of the fully foundational courses, they now have what they call introductory courses at first year level. They make them Africa centered in content, um, exploring power relations and so on. And they are available to all students, but only students on ECPs receive earmarked funding. But we have a bit of a wobble there because at the moment, it's still only ECP students taking them, which is a pity because they are really great courses for everybody. And um, then you also have the augmenting courses that are offered in first and second year and they are innovative and um, they integrate academic literacies. So if we look at assessing the humanities program against the, those 
policy outcomes that we spoke about. Um, the course pathways are good. Um, students on these courses and on these programs um, perform really well. Sorry, there's quite a lot of interference from, um, from someone's microphone. So can people maybe just check their microphones? Um, they also have now created flexible curriculum pathways and it's not that easy to tell anymore whether someone is on the extended or the regular. So we found that the humanities model ticked all the boxes, equity of access, bridging the articulation gap, equity of outcomes, and they are transformatory, mainly because the pedagogic insights that happen through this innovation um, is available to all students because there are such strong partnerships built across the faculty now with those introductory courses that are developed in the disciplines. But there are also policy constraints in that the introductory courses do not qualify for earmarked funding because they fall so somewhere between a fully foundational and an augmented course. So we are not clear about whether they will receive continued funding. The augmenting courses, I don't know whether you use them, but we find them really confusing and a huge administrative burden in that students have to register for the regular course and then this little augmenting satellite. So they have double the number of course codes. Um, and they are already students who struggle with an administrative burden. So they are not great courses from that point of view. Um, and also, they used at second year level, and that's that's great about the humanities model that students are still supported at second year level. But they don't necessarily need the 60%, the full 60% that you need to have extra tuition in augmenting courses. You don't necessarily need that at second year level and definitely not at third year level. But unless you do that, you're not going to get funding for that. So there are a number of constraints on the policy side. So just quickly to move on to the commerce model. Um, commerce has actually decided to have an extended program, but also an enhanced program. Um, the extended program takes longer. The enhanced program teaches extra, but doesn't take longer. And it doesn't comply with the uh, funding criteria of um, the ECPs. So we are not getting earmarked funding for the enhanced programs, only for the extended programs. And students can apply directly to these programs. Usually there are kind of, there's a lot of articulation between the programs. And at the beginning, they're all kind of on the same program and only later when they've written their maths and stats exams and so on, they usually transfer onto the extended program, whereas some other students stay on the enhanced. So they run in parallel. That's given us a lot of flexibility. It's, a, it's only for black applicants. They apply directly to programs, which means that the stigma has been lowered. Um, some students have lower entrance scores, but actually it's not a very strong access model. It's more towards the equity of outcomes. Um, there's additional teaching in both the extended and the enhanced curriculum um, in first and second year courses. And what is also different about the Commerce Pro uh, model is that they have an holistic approach. So they have these credit bearing courses that are basically advising courses, gives career and uh, personal development um, opportunities to develop. And they're compulsory for both extended and enhanced programs. So these are kind of like courses in which psychosocial issues are addressed and so on. And students also receive mentoring, psychosocial support, they have development offices, and they have a sort of one-stop shop for administrative support. Um, and together in this holistic approach, the program actually has very good um, results. High completion, compares very well with students on the regular pathways, sometimes passing their performance. And again, we find that in a limited way, it ticks the box, box for equity of access, but definitely for equity of outcomes, articulation gap, and definitely transformative in that students are connected to personal development and high stakes professional opportunities. 
But this model has huge policy constraints in that it, it's resource intensive and only the extended pathway qualifies for earmark funding, whereas most of the students are on the um, enhanced pathway. And the additional teaching time adds up to significant amounts across the curriculum, but per course, which is how the policy works, there isn't enough for us to qualify, enough extra to qualify for earmark funding. So actually the model is really underfunded. We just can't rely on earmark uh, foundation grant funding. Um, I realize I'm really hopping through this quickly. In science, we have a semi-extended transfer model where all students start at the beginning and then they have placement tests in April and they can transfer to one, two, three, or four courses at that point, and also in July. Um, so they have, some students have a semi-extended model. They do only two extended courses or, and they only qualify for extended program students if they have two or more extended courses. The fact that they transfer later and the transfer is voluntary has lowered the stigma. And there's been moderate, moderate gains, um, a completion rate of 53% over five years. There are more black graduates. Um, but a challenge is definitely that the performance of students drop off in the second and final years. Um, so they don't necessarily get into postgrad. So we can see when it comes to like how the program works against the policy outcomes, They've dropped the equity of access um, outcome. It's only equity of outcomes now. There, there are moderate games in the articulate, bridging the articulation gap, but not second year and up. And yeah, so it's not truly transformatory in that sense. And the extended programs are actually, those components are very separate. They don't really filter through into the rest of the faculty more so now, but not at the time when we wrote the paper. And the policy constraint is that students who transfer to only one or two courses do not necessarily earn earmarked funding. And students who, yeah, so students who stay on the regular cur uh, curriculum, we have resource constraints because we have these huge maths extended curriculum, uh, extended courses, but we get funding for only um, the ones who are on a full extended curriculum program. And then our last um, model that we looked at is engineering that works very much like science, except that the extension is only in maths and physics. They're placed after five weeks um, and they can also change in July. And we found that the transfer, it's a voluntary transfer model. And they were very important is to set boundaries for your availability. You do not have I think someone's, yeah, microphone is on. So um, we found that it was very powerful, the transfer, but it's voluntary. So a lot of students choose not to transfer and then they fail. So we found that the students who were advised to transfer to ECP, that's the white bar, but didn't, 73% um, of them ended up failing because they didn't take up that um, opportunity. So, but we, we cannot enforce it because we find that the moment you enforce it, it becomes more stigmatizing. So the transfer model proves to be a powerful tool, but it's voluntary and the, the benefit seems to persist. Um, and another area of the engineering model that's good is that they do extend support to the second year in a vector calculus course. Um, so the engineering faculty has dropped the equity of access um, outcome because it's a transfer model, um, but it actually ticks all the other boxes. Um, and it actually didn't have very strong po um, uh, policy constraints. It didn't show the policy constraints. Um, so engineering is actually working really well. So I'm going to move on to my um, um, the end of my paper where I basically ask at uh, the end of the presentation where we ask questions um, just to sum up. 
I think we can argue that these ECPs at UCT contribute to social justice and redress, even though we prioritize equity of outcomes. That is also what the, the policy said since 2001. Um, we found that fully foundational and augmenting courses could lead to stigma and also compulsory placement could lead to stigma. Um, often improved student performance does not last. Um, double teaching time or even 60% extra in the extended and augmenting and augmented courses is not really suited to providing targeted support in later years. It takes too much time and the senior students don't need so much support, although they need some support, which they at the moment not really get. Um, and current policy mechanisms hinder rather than promote full integration of ECPs, whereas the early policy wanted to promote integration and current policy doesn't really enable flexible and articulated curriculum pathways um, that give students a say in shaping their curriculum. And for that reason also ECPs are not as transformatory as they should or could be. So just some questions that I want to leave us with. So if we follow the significant ideas and events from the 1980s to now, what is it that we need from policy? Um, so from the apartheid imperatives through the policy integration phase and the terrible criticisms and accusations that we get during Peace Must Fall to, the, to now where we have this great need in the COVID time, what is it that we need from policy and I think another question is why, it, why is it so quiet on the policy front when we have such strong need? So for me, um, from looking at those quotes and the policy, it looks as if we've gone through a cycle of opportunity and challenge. A cycle where sometimes we were the activists and sometimes we were institutionalized ourselves and had to have activists rise up against us. So where are we now? What does this time ask of us? And why is there a policy lag? And there's a policy lag in terms of recognition. Does policy recognize that this is a moment of need? In terms of decision, are decisions being taken around how we steer the ACPs forward and around implementation? And how do we overcome it? So for me, it looks as if there is a new kind of activism necessary to get us out of this stasis. How do we devise policy to steer a large and diverse system accountably but flexibly while retaining responsiveness to imperatives, challenges and opportunities? And COVID has become a bit of an opportunity to jolt us out of this stasis. How do we leverage the moment in, and incorporate some of the gains that we've made? So there's an overwhelming need at the moment because of COVID for support and flexibility. At the same time, there's been some growth and capacity in evidence-based educational development. There's been a growth and capacity around academic advising. So, I mean, just a question I want to leave you with is, is it time to return to the idea of a more integrated, flexible curriculum for all students? And what is the policy that we are going to need in order to return to that? Um, the performance indicators of our higher education system are still not good. I think COVID has thrown up a new divide. I think um, it the equity that we've really striven for has been eroded by the fact that COVID has posed a whole lot of other set of um, barriers for students. So how are we going to use this COVID moment to think about a curriculum that would serve all students, would be more integrated and would be truly transformatory for, for the education system? So then I just have some of the references that people can look at. And I think maybe I'll just stop sharing so that we can look at each other. 
I mean, that was really an interesting uh, presentation and lovely the way that you brought it up to date. Um, and you've left us for about 15 minutes for discussion, which I think is quite good. So um, I'm inviting anybody who'd like to make a contribution, perhaps you'd like to raise your hand, perhaps you'd like to write something in the chat box. Um, where are we now? I know we've got people here from engineering, we've got people here from commerce, um, and uh, maybe even your colleagues would like to put a word in. Um, um, and so of course we... I, was, I was going to say, I would really like to, to ask my colleagues to come in on the questions. I mean, like when I said about the capacity that we've gained in the meantime, I mean, we have polite, really, and Riyashna both adding a lot of capacity in terms of academic advising and data evidence-based development. So, um, so there's noise outside. Why. There's noise in your garden. <laughs> Literally, sorry, I forgot I was on camera. Yeah, so I, I really just want to um, impress upon people that this is a team effort and that it would be very nice if they could come in and answer questions as well. Okay, so we open it up to the floor uh, and Riyashna and Polite, if there's something you even want to add to what Amina said, I think, you know, feel free to do that as well. So, um, anybody like to uh, put in a question? Especially in terms of uh, the way Hermina, Hermina has reflected on uh, the effect of COVID on the necessity for different policies. Any questions, comments? Or even just to hear from people. I mean, like, it's such a good opportunity to hear from you how you've experienced it. I mean, are you also like, um, it almost feels as if we've been dusted off and now kind of like, okay, you have a role to play. Help now. Yeah. <laughs> and I see uh, Janine, you've, un, um, I mean, Tabi uh, saying you've, uh, oh, Janine, you've got your hand up. Please oh, yeah. go ahead and ask your question. Janine is the head of academic programs in the Mamelodi program. So go ahead, Janine. So um, thank you so much, Amir. That was really um, a good dissection into the program from then and now. I really learned a lot. Uh, three years back, I listened to one of your colleagues about the way you plan this uh, voluntary transfer of students into um, the extended curriculum program. So I just wanted to, to touch on that because we are kind of trying to, we are about to review our way of um, selecting students into the program because we didn't have a proper selection, the students were just based on the result. So I wanted to find out how does it work? Who are the personnel do you have? Say that nobody comes to you. What happened to the personnel existing? Do you have existing personnel for ECP or the, the same lecturers for the main course also taking students into the extended curriculum program? Thank you. Okay, maybe we can talk about science and then Riyashna can come into it as well because she was part of science before she became um, deputy director. Um, so what and, and in engineering as well. In engineering, what happens is that um, the, we, we have dedicated ADP staff. So we have maths and physics lecturers there. And they actually teach in the mainstream for the first three, uh, six weeks. Because it gives them a very good sense of what is happening in the mainstream and what students struggle with. And it also builds that bridge with mainstream lecturers and so on. Then the transfer happens and they split off. Um, and we are very sure, I mean, with maths and physics, we are very sure that we are getting students. And in fact, in engineering now, students become so panicky um, early on that we are actually going to open up a, a cohort of students at the, from the beginning of the year again, because students within the first few weeks become very um, panicky about not keeping up with, and, and these are people with A symbols in maths and physics in the NEC. So very quickly, people 
we, we publicized the ADP, the, um, the extended program from early on, even during orientation. And we keep on saying to students, you may want to consider um, transferring if you, if you feel stressed. Um, and so from very early on now, we have students knocking on the door saying we would like to. So next year, we are actually going to start with the cohort from the beginning. And then we just add them in from April. It, it is a bit messy because sometimes you have to catch up with students while already continuing with others. In science, Ariashna, do the main do the ADP people teach on the mainstream for the first six weeks? Um, yeah. No, I think yeah. I think uh, in physics the lecturer does step in to be introduced to the class, but I don't think they actually teach per se. Um, and then I think computer science as well. I think Gary might teach a few uh, a little bit in there, but it's more about introducing the students to the ECP lectures yes. lecturers than them taking on a teach a part of the teaching load yeah and i must say we've had to jack up our advising systems to counsel yes. students into the transfer yes. in kind of responsible ways to me so that that, that yes. is and those are kind of like we are uh, in science we've now pulled in lecturers beyond adp like everyone mm. is now counseling and we've the counseling is online um, yes sorry that's very important then my follow-up question how different is the curriculum or the course content when they transfer into the extended curriculum program compared to the main one um it's the same curriculum but it's taking longer so yes. it's an extended in science it's extended yeah. so they take a year over as you know they it's a full year course um so a semester course is extended into a year, a year. or uh, and then so the with the extra time is extra teaching so yeah. usually it will be additional tutorials um mm. and so it just slows the pace uh, but gotcha. the content and learning outcomes remain identical to the mainstream courses so interestingly we've selected to um to have extended maths biology physics courses in science but in um, engineering we have augmented maths and physics yes. courses because okay. they are kind of like so much the foundation of engineering that students drop all the engineering courses and, and and make space for the augmented courses so they just have these concentrated maths and physics courses for the first year and uh -huh. then they start bringing back some engineering Okay. Once in the extended program, can the students switch back to the main program or the remaining? I just want to see the dynamic. Uh, technically, they probably can, but it would be difficult. Okay. It would be quite difficult because they would have to do a lot of catch up quickly. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank it's, you. It, yeah. Uh, anybody yeah, else like? Think would run into issues of timelines for curriculum change so you can't just change into a course midstream we have de specific deadlines so besides the articulation issue um you actually logistically can't do it either erica would you like to come in from the point of view of engineering yes uh, thank you prof marissa um, I, I've been listening with great interest because I agree with a lot that has been said, especially now also in terms of students transferring, in our case, from the Engage program into the four-year program or other way around, rather, the four-year program students also realizing a bit later that they really need to be in the Engage program. We actually did some research on that a year or so ago where we tried to determine uh, how many students from the 1,400, um, I think, at that stage uh, would have benefited from transferring from the four-year to engage in terms of the number of years which they would take to complete a degree. And it was, um, it was less than 50 students oh, that wow. benefited directly. And for that reason, we then said, we're not um, 
chucking the idea out, but we're shelving it because it's a huge log logistical exercise. Yes. If yes. that's done. Yes. Um, so yes, in our case, if a student is placed in a four-year degree program, then um, they can transfer uh, for the first two, three weeks or so, but after that, they don't allow it. We've had, had, we've had single students over the past years who actually started in Engage and then performed very well and then with oh, right. from the Dean could go back to the four-year degree program and actually manage to complete in four years. So that was oh, yeah. fantastic, but that's yeah. really then very strong students. So we also have really this very strong pressure about graduation and students not finishing in a minimum time of five years. So there's a lot of pressure there. And we are looking at alternatives uh, as we go along, as you will know, the whole sort of a turnaround strategies is there for us where we have to prove that we are doing this better than the rest, although we're not doing much worse than the rest. Yeah. Um, the one thing that I wanted to ask you is uh, with last year with the COVID, we had to cancel our NBT tests. And apparently it's going to happen again for the placement of next year. So that actually resulted in us this year having about 300% over prescription. Yes. Uh, and, um, and that had quite uh, serious implications. Um, and our numbers are quite up from what it usually is simply because of that, but I think without it's the- really stumbling around in the dark, hey? It was a yes. really hard, yeah. Yes, that really was also very, very difficult for us. So I'm glad to hear that you have the same problem. <laughs> yeah, we are definitely oversubscribed in some faculties. Um, and, and also there was the feeling that you don't know what students are capable of. Yes. So absolutely. we didn't even know whether, and, and the same, yeah, so this year's intake um, had to write the NEC under COVID conditions, so yes. we just don't know what they can and can't do. Yeah, absolutely. But we're still finding out. Yeah, we, <laughs> our, we will be finding out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our Thank enrollment you. in engineering is really high on the transfer. Lots of students are transferring. So, That's yeah, very, that, very, very interesting. Um, Prof. Gude, did you want to say something? I saw you unmute. Uh, I thought maybe you wanted to chip in. Yes, I, I just wanted to, to thank Ermin and, and give them a sense of, of, um, of where we are ourselves, you know, in terms of extended programs. And it's just fascinating to me how different institutions have actually interpreted the policy. And, and it would be interesting to see how the whole sector, what positions they have taken, especially vis-a-vis -vis the social justice and the stigmatization you know, issue. I think U, UP was quite aware right up front uh, because of the separate campus that stigmatization was going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we then used our strategic drivers, you know, one of which is its diversity, to say every campus has to be diverse. And in the process, we actually veered away from the social justice mandate to the point where the profile of ECP students the majority are quintiles five and six, you know, Marisa did the analysis. So we're now looking back and saying, you know, why do we still have this poor throughput, yet we take the best students? Yeah. Yeah. And we, 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 we've advanced the argument that being redress programs, ECPs ought to have taken students from quintiles one to three, whose potential is not optimized. Mm -hmm. Because we took five to six who have, you know, uh, you know, who have not really succeeded. Um, so, I, you know, um, that that has been our argument. Right? And the the real question here is that uh, I mean, the real issue is that in all faculties except education, 
there you know a uh, up admits uh, let me say be common and economics especially a uh, way you know with the extended programs i'm talking about they actually accept less than 20 percent quintile one to three students so the profile is the same yeah. as in ecps all quintiles four five six mainly five six so you know just to cut a long story short the dilemma i think we find ourselves in with COVID now is COVID will disproportionately affect quintiles one and three schools it's no longer about black students it's about socioeconomic it's about class now so we are saying let's go back to the social justice mandate stay within the social justice mandate but develop academic pathways and really track the students appropriately, especially because of COVID-19. So I don't know how you and your colleagues, you know, what advice you could give us, um, because to open up the system and forget about the social man mandate justice of quintiles one and three schools and focus on the color of the students, I think is becoming a serious problem in higher education, especially research institutions. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was a bit long winded, but I, I hope it, it conveys the message. Yeah, I mean, I think UCT tried to that. That's really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Tabi Singh. I mean, like in 2016, UCT adopted a new admissions policy because it wanted to step away from race and more towards social disadvantage. And I mean, we haven't, I think it was due for review and then COVID happened as with so many other things. Um, but I think what the hope was that that admissions policy would actually bring in people regardless of race uh, because they, 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 they were weighted in terms of social disadvantage. And the argument is basically that someone who's had social socioeconomic challenges and came out with a 60 or a 70% is, is probably a genius or much better than someone who's had the best education and gone to these high quintile schools and come out with an 80%, whereas everyone else they So we take the top students from those schools and the 80 percenters might not make it and then we take um, students who maybe haven't scored that high but the scores are weighted uh, with the social disadvantage um, weighting and i think it has kind of like i mean i i, I hope we'll have an, an analysis of that really soon but I do think it has actually brought in more sort of rural and working class students of high caliber, high potential. Whether we have served them well, I mean, we still have the achievement gap. Um, we really do need to disaggregate in terms of socioeconomic disadvantage to see whether we are actually managing to at least kind of help students over that gap. But there's so much work to be done, you know, and I I still kind of despair a little bit um, at, I, I don't know how others experience it, but we're sitting with this really outdated policy. I mean, it just feels that the world is world passes. We've had student protest, we've had COVID now. And when we inquire about policy, it's still that kind of slightly adjusted set of rules that now seems to be before a ministerial committee. And it's not going to serve our purposes. I mean, what you're talking about in Tabi Singh, just slightly with redrawing um, the ECP policy guidelines is not going to help us. Right. Um, I just want to point out to everybody, we're about five minutes oh, over time now. <laughs> it was such an interesting conversation that I didn't want to chip in because uh, I wish we could have more time to talk. Um, I know that this happens to be the only slot in the ECP timetable during the week where everybody doesn't have a lecture. So um, uh, 
I think we'll have to call it a day here, but um, uh, you know, maybe we can get together and have a conversation sometime in the future because there's so much, and I think uh, so much that people are thinking about. And thank you, Ermin, for preparing with Riyashna and um, Polite. Uh, we've really, I mean, I found it riveting and very interesting. And uh, it's just a pity we don't have more time to talk about this. So uh, I think without- Marisa, yes. Marisa yes. Can, can I ask uh, that uh, maybe you just allow Riyashna to, to respond? She was about to respond and maybe we can yeah. talk after that. <laughs> yes. I'm really keen uh, to hear what she would like to say. No, no, me too. I was just feeling the tension between people dropping out of the talk and- yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think people but, should be free to go, but you know, maybe yeah. give Riyashna a chance. So let's let's just uh, publicly publicly thank our speakers very much, and those who have to go somewhere do drop out, uh, and then we'll just finish up the discussion that we're on, and then we'll say goodbye to our guests. <laughs> Thanks, Marissa. Um, so uh, now, I, now I feel the pressure to say something really smart. <laughs> well, we know you are, so we're waiting. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to comment. Uh, it was kind of it kind of picks up on on Prof Ogude's comment, and then and then what Armin was talking about. What we have, in a sense, almost experimented with what she uh, was referring to in um, in her uh, conceptualization of going back to those transfer those redress um that redress agenda through taking these students with the potential but not the opportunity um and then bringing them into the institution and, and providing opportunity and then Armin having mentioned that in some ways we've done that with our redress categories and um to and and then so where my it's almost more of a question um than than a response is but then what does it take to get those students, if we if we are taking those students with all that potential, I and mean, we're applying what we have now to get them uh, the support that we can give them, not the support they need, because the outcomes are not showing us that they're getting the support that they need, suggests to me that for one, of course, academic support is not the only thing that these students need. Um, so that is the first thing. Um, and then what does it, so then what does it take? Um, and, you know, we've got examples of places like Georgia State University and stuff that have um, changed the outcomes by addressing some of these other challenges that students are facing. Where we're looking at this from an academic advising perspective as well. My, what I'm saying is when we consider policy, if we were to go to that model and we consider policy it has to take into account all these other challenges um, and how we support that, because you cannot just support writing interventions and literacies um, to get, because we know about the correlation between those, dis those disadvantage indices and the student's potential um, outputs. We see that with, um, we've seen that a lot with COVID. If students don't have the proper learning environment, if they don't have the proper connectivity, if they don't have, you don't, you don't maximize that potential either. So it's just uh, yeah, just throwing in the comment that it's it's quite it's, it's a quite complex in terms of the the amount of support that will be needed and how does the policy actually address that if at the moment we can't even get them to budge on sixty percent versus fifty percent teaching time, so yeah. And the, um, and the go ahead, I mean, and the policy is a pre-online policy, so none of the stuff that we do online we really know how to quantify. So. So I will really call for a new activism around because we are wasting a lot of time trying to conform to a policy that doesn't serve us. So how do we toy toy on Zoom is the next question. <laughs> um, the one thing I did want to throw into the pot is that I discovered, you know, BITS doesn't have any uh, ECP programs, maybe some something very small somewhere, but um, they, but their figures, they do a, a huge questionnaire with the new student. And we discovered they did a quintile study on their incoming students per faculty. 
And the first year they did it, they didn't break it down by faculty. And there was something like close to a third of the students from quintile one, two, three schools. And then oh, I thought, no, it's those courses that don't need mathematics, you know, it's humanities, it's education, etc. And then they brought out the faculty background. And um, it turns out that the faculties with the high numbers of quintile one, two, three students are engineering wow. and science, but not medicine, which is interesting. And I think medicine has a completely different way of admitting the students. Wow. Um, and I just want to draw everybody's attention to um, Prof. Goodes' comment, in case you didn't see it. Yeah. Um, uh, and I didn't because I was too busy talking. Um, About the um, why D8 and yeah. the CHP abandoned the idea of a flexible policy. Yeah. yeah the, the, you know, uh, Ian Scott produced a document, yeah. quite detailed document on exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. On, on having a three-year track for students that can manage that and a four-year one. And we, four year we, default. Yeah. And we we invested a lot of energy, you know, into that debate. Yeah. And we need to revisit that discussion first. Yes. To really understand why it was abandoned. Uh, you know, for, for us to, to start to doing again. <laughs> no, but I can there was a big toy toy. There has been a continuous toy toy, actually, you know, yeah. uh, Ernie, yeah. uh, you yeah. know uh, and, and Riyash. There has been a, a continuous toy toy. The question is, does COVID-19 present a new opportunity? Yeah. Maybe that's what we should be asking, whether it presents a new opportunity to surface that you know, uh, argument again, then I would support, you know, uh, what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there anybody else who'd like to raise another point or is this a good time to close the uh, session? Um, I see a couple of people chirping in the chat, which is quite nice. So I think uh, maybe we should all switch on our mics and give a round of applause to our presenters. Uh, uh, Lisa, before we go back, can I ask if um, we can have a follow up discussion with uh, Amian and his team? Maybe one of another session to follow up the discussion. You mean a seminar slot or yeah. uh, just call them in for a discussion? What do you think? To, to follow up because we need to find solution. We present problems, so maybe we can follow up on the, on the topic. I was wondering whether we could join your slot. If you have a regular ECP slot. Okay. We have a regular seminar slot. I try to, I'm supposed to be the one who organizes the seminars. And uh, I tried to do three in the first semester and three in the second semester. Um, the one next, is actually next week, is by the ECP staff talking about reflecting on these first six months of con completely online teaching. Wow, yeah. And uh, we'd be great to, be, I'm, I'm Joni's, I think she's still there. She is, she is. Uh, um, if she would add you onto the guest list, yeah. you're very welcome to join in. It would be an honor to have you here. Next week, I won't be able to make it, but I would be very interested to yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll send you a list. Um, that will be the last one this semester. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, no, I think there's one more. I can't remember. Um, that would be fantastic. Sorry, we are sort of date crashing. We will add you as well on our teaching and learning days or workshop, Erica, the second one. Maybe we'll look at the topic and then you can extend our invitation to you so that... Uh, that is being yeah. that would be the second semester, the teaching and learning day seminar. We we had a wonderful teaching and learning day. Um, they, we had two people from bits, one from humanities and one from engineering, and um, I can't remember who else, but it was a really good program, um, and I think it allowed people to talk quite a lot about what was going on. Oh, oh that, this is great. I mean, like that's another opportunity, COVID opportunity yeah. that we do. Couldn't yeah, there are, there are benefits as well as... Uh, <laughs> we realize we don't have to travel. 
Um, yeah, so that would be good. And I think we need to keep our eye on the national, I mean, like Professor Goody, maybe we can just talk about how we're going to use health class uh, and so on to really with pressure. Yeah. Yes, I, I was just typing something, you know, maybe I should just say it. Um, I don't know whether we could, such, you know, whether we could get hold of Ian and somebody has a preliminary discussion with him to say, what does COVID-19 mean? And that document, which, you know, yeah. uh, you know, uh, which, which, which was never, that policy document which has never taken up. I think for me, that is, that is a debate we can pursue. Yeah. And it's much wider than ECPs. We can continue with our seminars, yes. but is this an opportunity for us within the ECPs to really say ourselves that ECPs, we, you know, we do not believe they are relevant in the advent of COVID because people are really sensitive and, and you know, they feel it's imposing if it comes outside the ECP. So I think whether this is taken within the forum of El Tassa or somewhere else, I think coming out of here, we should really elevate this to a different forum while we continue our debates around ECPs. Yes. How about if I keep in touch with Amin and feedback to Prof. Gude, if you, some more ideas. By the way, the one guest I did forget at that Teaching and Learning Day was Ian. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, we can even present something at, at El Tassa, raising yeah. these questions from a UP and a UCT side. I mean, something like that. Maybe we should just continue discussing it. Yeah. El Tasa will be in November, will it? Yeah, we have a. Yeah, week. well, at, at, at any chance when we get, yeah. Or, or just have like a, a, a seminar, you know, yeah. based on, it doesn't have to be attached to any conference. Yeah, I mean, I it say, could be a, a Hel Tasa initiative. Yeah. A it seminar really or something liberating. like that. It would be really liberating if we could work without the constraints. Yeah, and we yeah. could invite somebody from the DHEST. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, who do you know in Heltasa who would be a good person to help us get this going? I mean, um, well, Kasturi is there. Um, and um, Ntabi Singh, aren't you part of the SIC? No, I, I, I passed that one. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Okay, but there's a regional one quite soon as well, a um, regional health class. Uh, um, I'll, I will look around. Um, it won't be next week, but after that, I'll look around. No, that, that's, uh, and then I'll feed back to all the UP people. Okay, okay. But I will also, I mean, if you put me on the invitation list, I'll also rock up again, so. Did you hear that, uh, Janine? I yes, mean, yes. Uh, Joni, Joni. Yes, yes. <laughs> Did you hear yeah, it, another, we another... yeah, Ashna, do you also <laughs> want to be included and polite? Please just sing, okay? And Megan, I think, would also. Megan. Brown. Megan. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I may, I'm going on research leave. Uh, in it doesn't matter. I'll so include I'm you guys and you can. <laughs> I'd like and to me too. Yes. Yeah. And Megan Bam, I think, would also. All right. Yeah. Do. Okay, that was lovely. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, 